I think it's time to start. We have a very, very packed program. So the thing we start, the most stressed it will be to keep the program. So I think we start. So welcome so much, everyone. It's, can I? Yes, I can. Okay. Okay. Any time for in the room? Too much shouting. So I to go down and then. Okay. So this is actually the ninth album conference. Yeah, let's record it. Yeah, <laughs> We may need that will be a lot of work. So, we are even more people than we ever knew. Nearly 138 which is quite a lot. Um, even though two years have come with the great help of the old universal um, and the complex. But we have a we have a virtual competence here also because we would like to take the pieces that are not able to cover due to many uses. So we have 350 virtual competence. So I'm so happy to see you all. Uh, my name is Christine Bro. I'm the director of the new center. I'll tell more about that later. And I'm a professor at the Bar Department of Informatics here at the University of Oslo. So, but now I'm only introducing our opening speaker, Lee Martin Uda. She's a um, policy director in NORAD. NORAD, you know NORAD, our oldest friend. So we are so happy that Lee Martin is actually coming here to open this conference. She's a policy director, but she's also a co-lead, together with you, you said, actually, um, of the uh, Global, not Global, Digital Public Good Alliance. So she's here to talk about that a little bit as well. She will actually have a little bit of a keynote together with us in the cross-sector session in the plenary on Thursday. So we work together. So this is not just a, a courtesy call. This is a real presentation. So over to you. Thank you.
Are, are you able to hear me in time? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you so much, Kristen. It's really hard to speak after Kristen. Um, it's, it's impossible to match that energy level, level at any time. And I'm not going to try. I'm going to stand here and stand still. I'm not going to do the dance. It's such an honor to be here. Um, and uh, and uh, I, I really do feel like uh, I'm a partner of this, even though I haven't met all of you. Um, and I'll say why. Um, as, as Christian mentioned, I, I do call it the Digital Public Goods Alliance. Um, and uh, I am based at the Norwegian Agency for Development Corporation, so NORAD. And the concept of digital public goods, I stress tested this with uh, Ola. I asked, how many people here do you think actually, you know, has any kind of feeling of what that concept is? And he said, ah, 30, 50%. And I said, but they all know what DHIS2 is. And he said, of course. And they all know DHIS2 is open source. And he said, of course. Um, so that's kind of a very important part of it. Um, the definition of digital public goods is something that comes from the UN Secretary General himself. I'm going to turn myself down a little bit, just pick up. Um, and uh, it came uh, as a result of a re report from the high level panel on digital cooperation. Um, that the UN Secretary General established in 2018. And 2018 is, of course, a long, long time after <laughs> this endeavor started. Uh, and I would say that no one exemplifies the essence of what digital public goods mean better than this crowd. And also the crowd that is with us uh, virtually today. And although the open source part of the concept of digital public goods, because that's what they mean, uh, it's a reference to open source uh, technologies, software, content data standards um, that adhere to certain minimum principles around user uh, safety, privacy, and also that has some kind of relevance to the sustainable development goals. That's the technical definition, but the essence is really around community. And this is where I really think that the HIS2 stands out. It's the community. Uh, and it's a community that's uh, rooted in local ownership. And it's locally that innovation happens. And that's what the topic of the conference is today also, um, from local innovation to global progress. And increasingly, what I think you will see in, uh, in many other countries, and what you have probably seen in many other countries that you're working is that increasingly you will come into other types of projects that are based around open source technologies that are being implemented. And many of them are being integrated also uh, with DHIS2 in the field. Uh, examples include Divoc, which many of you probably know, uh, SORMAS, um, and you may also have come across digital public goods in other sectors or for um, that are enablers, for instance, of, of the progress also in the health sector, such as digital identity systems. There's one called MOSIP, for instance, that NURAD also supports alongside the HIS2. And what I am seeing um, as um, co-lead of this Digital Public Goods Alliance, which is very much around um, accelerating attainment of the sustainable development goals through allowing these um, uh, open technologies uh, as a basis for adaptation and adaptation across countries uh, with much more speed. So some, yeah. uh, what we're seeing is that everyone wants to learn from the HIS2, but they don't want, I mean, of course, there's great stuff that happens with the technology, the core management of the technology, and, that, and that's, you know, wonderful. But every time I think in every conversation I've had with Christine over these years, she's always said the technology is important, but that's not what matters. That's not the most important part about the HIS2. It's the community, it's HISP. Um, and that's really what um, everyone tends to focus too much on the technology and not ask about the capacity building model and all of the uh, what is happening in the community around it and how it's uniquely anchored across the globe. And that is something we're really, really trying to learn from. Uh, and that's probably why I'm invited here <laughs> and probably why I'm a big fan. Um, and and uh, um, we need to find a way of making capacity building be at the core of all of these initiatives. Um, and I think the role of academia, uh, masters, this, uh, uh, masters and PhD programs, the HISP academies, 
all of these things that have been built up over so many years and that even came before the technology was open source. Um, that is the essence of, of <laughs> why we're here today. And it's it's something that cannot uh, it cannot be done quickly. Um, it's taken, I don't know, 30 years? Yeah, to get to it. Yeah, something like that. Uh, to get to uh, to get to where this uh, initiative is today, um, but what I think is so privileged for someone like me now, who's working then on an attempt of, of of building up an alliance around digital public goods, is that not only can we leverage the model, the learnings, but my hope is that we can actually leverage you, <laughs> as in the community, because this is a community of, and I was counting. Uh, more than 300 people who will be here in Oslo physically, around 400 and people, 400 something people attending virtually, probably. Yeah, and the community, of course, is also much bigger than that. The the people that have somehow been involved in implementing DHIS over the years, which means that it's a global community that can be leveraged also to help uh, scale the essence of this model. Um, and why is this so important? I think what we've seen uh, in the alliance that that I've been building up uh, together with others and which has now really scaled so that we have many countries joining as members, many of the same countries that are also implementing DHIS2, is that there's really this real strong drive um, for what we refer to as digital sovereignty, or it has many names. But what it means in essence is that governments are increasingly um, uneasy about either having to um, uh, being forced to uh, to adopt proprietary technologies that has many types of ven long-term vendor lock-ins. I mean, there are many good proprietary technologies that need to be part of the mix, but there's also this, particularly for them, what we talk about is these digital public infrastructures, uh, ID um, systems, payment uh, platforms, being forced to, um, uh, to adopt proprietary techniques, safe uh, data exchange layers, there is this risk of having monopolies festering throughout your entire system if you get them wrong. And many countries are really, and that, that's countries all over the world, world. It's also in Norway happening here now. There is an increasing drive to build in-house capacity to actually be in control over um, the rights to the technologies that are being deployed. But many countries do not have the luxury of building these technologies for, from scratch. So there is a real need for these generic open source technologies that can be adopted and adapted. But in order to do that, there's a need for in-house capacity and there's a need for that agency that comes of being involved in implementing uh, and, and being part of that digital transformation in country. And that's a model that even though it is at the core <laughs> of the HIS2 and the HISP community, I mean, I don't have to tell you guys about this, it's not something that has happened in any sector. In international development, it's it hasn't happened in education. It's starting to happen a bit in education, but that's because of DHIS2 actually being implemented for MS in countries. And it hasn't happened in uh, payment systems. Uh, it hasn't happened in digital identity, but it's starting to happen in digital identity now. It um, uh, started with India. Um, and when and if this transformation towards more local ownership and and more sovereignty in these processes is going to happen and if it's going to happen right capacity building needs to be part of it and it has to be um it has to be done in a completely different way than the traditional um business as usual international development assistance for instance um it has to be locally grown and locally owned and therefore um, when when uh, Christine talks about you know going beyond health uh, for DHIS2, I see two ways. Um, one thing is the ad adoption of DHIS2 into other sectors, such as education, water and sanitation, agriculture. That's happening already, um, and I think that's like a natural evolution. But DHIS2 will not be the only digital system on the planet, and no one wants that. There's not like one system to rule them all. So there's also, you know, all of the integrations that's happening. Um, and I really, really, so I see Beyond Health as DHIS2 going beyond health, but I also see it as HISP, as a community going beyond health. So I'm very, very excited because Nura, this community... <laughs> 
is collaborating with uh, uh, with uh, his on both of these issues, both on adop adopting DHIS two, but also on adopting the capacity building uh, and the regional hub model. So um, I'm actually gonna like end with uh, saying thank you so much for having me here. But I also really, really hope that we can tap into you uh, in the countries where you are working, and that you can. Um, help be part of this journey of helping scale a model of digital public goods so that um, we can uh, leverage this unique experience into something that becomes the model for how um, digital cooperation happens uh, in the future. Thank you. Ah. There we are. Thank you so much. Now we must actually mention nearly all of our topics for the conference. That's good. So we are well, very well aligned. I just need to mention, since you mentioned our new collaboration, is we are just granted from Nora 10 PhD scholarships. For building capacity in countries through the his groups for global digital public good. So that's cool. So you will hear a little bit cross-sector things during that this week. So apologies for all the health people, but there's a lot of things happening because what we have learned from the pandemic is that it's beyond health. We went from the basement to the little bit top uh, Minister of Health to the presidency level when it's come to the pandemic because it in, involves civil registries, involved finance, it's all involved port of entry, immigration at the ports, and so forth, meaning the world, <laughs> through our uh, global HIST model, have understood the, the way of doing digitalization and e-governance through an open source platform like DHS2. And that we need to le leverage. And this model, so that's why I'm actually today will present a little bit more about the capacity building model because we take it for granted. And everyone says, but you need to be more explicit when it comes to the way we are working because that is the secret soup. It's not, it, it's of course it's a software as well, but it's more about how we are enabling capacity in country to create ownership and make the platform relevant at any time, both technological, but also use case wise to following what's happening in the world, to have global progress through these local innovations. So this local innovation, you see the picture here is from, oh, Prosper, you can arrest me, but type May 2020, where all the truck drivers were, lo were, were standing put at the border of uh, Uganda with all the goods coming into the whole East Africa because they were not tested out of the queue. Then very fast and innovation have made real-time monitoring from the lab results. So getting um, certificates on, on the, the negatives, also for the positives, to get them out of the queue into the country and to the rest of the East Africa. That's just an example of how um, this platform to innovate on top, but also sharing these innovations. Like uh, Andrew Mohir from, from his Rwanda says, we are sharing. I said, well, you are, we are don't, not innovating. We are sharing all the innovation from the, all the older East groups. You are stealing, but we are proud of stealing innovations. And when it's implemented in your country, it's domesticated and it's cultivated into your local innovation. So we are here to share and steal. So from 1st of January, we were actually been <laughs> upgraded promoted as a center, acknowledged by the University of Oslo as something very multidisciplinary, a little bit higher up in the hierarchy. And we also have our fantastic uh, new offices that we opened officially last week, the center, but also the offices, because we are, I just wanted to show the colors, it's pretty bright colors and all pasted with the, with the um, field work pictures from, from all of the countries in, in the office. So that's a little bit of the opening, but that's more for the party. And we are, you know, you know we, are, we are a bit into parties as well. So this is the net result. You have seen this many times. So this is just, a very, very, very short glance. That's kind of the adoption uh, uh, by Minister of Health 
And how we do the global footprint, you cannot see it under there because we have a line, 2.4 billion people are living in the country with uh, using DHS2 as a national health information system, HMI system. How has that been possible? I need to uh, acknowledge also all the investors in the platform and all the, also the partnership we have with investors because that partnership has been so, I would say, uh, crucial for for how we have been able to work and become relevant, but also mobilize funds when things matters. It was, you know, the, the first many years. Did I did I skip the the history slide? No, it's coming. Hopefully, okay. The first many years, we were only having a research fund and UIO, and then PEPFAR, Global Fund, NORAD came in to this three-party partnership. However, all the investors were lurking. We call it in the social media world, but they were always sitting in, in the partner meeting, becoming part of the discussions of how can we make this as an open source platform relevant for all the countries, not only for the, the ones that are happen to have finance, because we would like to share it with all countries. We were truly open source. And then we have had all the other partners coming along. And now we are preaching and reaching out to the to cross sector partners like education, climate health, climate, and so forth. And we have been bragged about as a global public good for a while uh, through Martis uh, <laughs> work with our government, but even the previous prime minister was proud and presented this. So how has this been possible? I can see my first slide about the history uh, is, is, is not there. It's... No. But we know that when you when we have a French presentation, it takes double as time. I know that. And I'm not speaking French, and not because I'm stupid, as some somebody think that I cannot learn French. But I don't speak French. I'm so sorry. But then I can just pause a little talking about the history because the history slide is not there. Um Lee Martin was indicating this has been taking 30 years. And it's almost 30 years, it's 28 years since. Uh, Jörn Bro, Arthur Haywood, from uh, having the first presentation, the first uh, implementation, and starting to discuss with Kalla and the rest, Nora and the rest of the team in South Africa, uh, collaborating with the University of Western Cape on making a reconstruction of the health sector after apartheid. So that is our soul. So it started as an action research project. Jörn's, uh, Jörn Bro, my brother, not not husband. Um, he will assume, you know, I'm the wife. So uh, um, as his PhD program pro project, and he have continued to be action research. So we usually say it's traveling through geography from South Africa, scaled up to the whole South Africa in 2000, to rest of Africa, India, Asia, uh, and geography. So technology from um, Microsoft Access to whatever technology available, cloud-based services, web-based uh, DHS2, when it's become 2, 2.0, uh, web 2.0 uh, alluded to, uh, and, um, and the mobile internet and so forth. So we always use the latest technology in order to create resilient, sustainable, scalable system that can be relevant and flexible for all kinds of use cases. And that takes a group of people. So we need, so, so this is the secret soup. It's actually that the invisible hands of action research is that we have all these HISP groups, all these PhD scholars, all this master program that have been supported from the Norwegian government long time ago, seven of them. We are now continuing, we are now getting into it again to actually form all our knowledge into master program because the master program is there to stick. They are there to stay. So even though it stopped the funding in 2008 or 10 or something, it's still there. And we are still recruiting from the uh, master programs that are existing in those countries. And we are now starting up in many other countries. Uh, and then we are collaborating with the government, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Health, min the ministries, in order to 
build our cap the capacity in the ministry through participatory design. That's why it takes time. So we are there to commit to teach people how can you own your own system? How can you customize your system so you can actually answer to the pandemic's new request on legislations and knowledge about how to handle the COVID-19 situation? Because you can easily change that platform to, to and innovate on apps on top in order to cater for these kind of new uh, things happening in the world. So that is the, the, the local innovation and the global progress. So this action research is actually building knowledge about how to do resilient um, information systems, e-governance, digital e-governance, while actually doing it. And when we're doing it, we do it, of course, together with the people in country, being um, mentored by the HISP groups, building capacity in the country, being having global resources to the mentors, to the his, to the people in the country. So we become bigger and bigger, and that's how this community has become bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Because everyone that learn and become part of this family are part of this family for life. That's not a threat. <laughs> so what we do is actually knowledge-based. So this research is not like academic, only academic research. Of course it is also because we have 73 graduated um, uh, PhD scholars from this program. We even have a, a defense on Wednesday. Uh, Magnus Lee from the, the that head the DSS2 the, the Design Lab. He's graduating his PhD. He has a defense on Wednesday. But we are actually using this knowledge in order to do better, more relevant design and implementation and share that with everyone. And that, that's not stealing, but you know, stealing is nice. So all this, and the, the academies, regional academies, we need to be regional, we need to be physical again. That has been kind of the locomotive of dissemination of these um, innovations and best practices. And what we see is most important in these regional academies that you guys probably have attended, held by the his groups locally in the region, sharing best practice and innovations, but the, the best part is actually to be inspired. So what we see is if, 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 if uh, Kenya can do it, then now I will be scolded. Tanzania can do it. That was the one that was mobile internet. So we are not ranking people there, but all the innovation can be shared in the, will be and are shared. So these his groups are, part, are now leaders of uh, the PhD scholars are often the leaders of these his groups. Mm -hmm. So this um, uh, machinery is actually either going, the local innovation, either going into a custom app Low, uh, generic app or be part of the um, the new release the next time half a year after always coming with capacity and one way or another how you can get these solutions in your hands so these are uh, these are the reason these are the his groups we have 17 we got a new one in pakistan during the pandemic so welcome pakistan funded by Gavi. Now, Gavi, sorry, Gates, it was G. Sorry, Gavi. Now, you, Gates. So, these um, regional his groups are very critical component of our strategy because they provide long time, often lifetime, often unpaid <laughs> uh, support to the ministries in countries. So, that's why I'm talking this because we really need also to, to, sh to see how this can be sustainable, the business model as well. But that is the commitment that we always work with the ministry because, we sh because why we are here is because what's happening in the countries. It's actually there in the countries that make us sustainable, make us famous for being able to support that many countries because this is a community where everyone can grow and shine. So the closeness to the field is so important because how can DHS to be relevant for 20 uh, over years? Because we always are in dialogue with the field and get scolded every time we are not really, really uh, hitting the target. And then we have all the, these groups to, to feed back. How can we then change the platform to be even more relevant? And of course, the donors and the funders is super important. And I will, I'm guessing I'm using too much time. 
And also this partnership we have had with our donors showed that we were able to move fast, faster than any during the pandemic, because we already had that partnership. We already had that trust. We have already shown that we can be relevant for what's happening in, in globally and never have the global world been smaller than the pandemic because the use case was almost the same everywhere. So then mobilizing funds to get the machinery going, machinery meaning all the his groups that were able to support um, support countries digitally, remotely, because everywhere there was locked down. Okay, so this network of partners share the same values. So in order to be a HIST group, you need to sign an MOU, and sign an MOU, there's 12 bullet points of values that need to be shared and signed in blood. Meaning everything can be still every, stolen, everything shall be shared. So then, already in uh, uh, 27th of January, uh, Sri Lanka uh, got the two first uh, confirmed cases. And Sri Lanka, as you know, a tourist country, and Sri Lanka has a strong haste group. They were able then uh, uh, to make an app, of port, port of Entry app, already two days later. How could that be possible? They had already been in negotiation and discussion with the ministries to be able to do that. So they spent Vero. five five days. Vero. That was fished because we, we use Slack. And then we saw on Slack, Max and me and everyone, uh, uh, we called our brother, look what's happening. So we told in the but, however, Sri Lanka was able to respond fast, and that inspired the whole HISP network. How was that possible? You will hear the story tomorrow, in the plenary session, tomorrow. Okay? So sort of rest is history. 47 countries are now using uh, DHS2 for, for disease surveillance on, on COVID-19, even also vaccine for vaccine delivery. Uh-oh, I'm taking that after. And this is the example for the launch of uh, all the vaccine certification from, from Rwanda. And that was in the national news. And even Norway followed. This is from the newspaper in Norway saying, wow, in Sri Lanka and, and, uh, and uh, um, Uganda, they're using open source software. In Norway, we use pen, pen and paper and no standards. And 364 uh, decisions in the municipalities to, 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 to how can we do this? Okay, so now DHS2 is used in Norway for the first Western country ever that used DHS2 for contact tracing. That's a cool story, isn't it? And they're even, they're even thinking, discussing with us Oh, will, will DHS2 um, survive another five years? Yeah, we think so. Uh, so they are now regarding using DHS2 as for all disease surveillance in Norway. So that, that's, that's discussions. So I have hinted on all these arguments already, how we were able to mobilize the whole global digital community, his community, that fast. Of course, mobilizing funds. Thank you, Nora. First time called. Two, two weeks into the pandemic, three weeks, uh, not to the lockdown, how much can you guys absorb? And everybody knows that we have absorptive capacity when it comes to budgets. I said 10 million Norwegian girls, oh, come on, think bigger. Okay, can, 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 can think bigger. So then we just push the apparatus. So all the history was enabled. You just do whatever you can do. That's the history. And we already had the digital tools because we have been collaborating digitally for years. So that's how we were able to share, learn, steal, snap innovations across the globe, being the first in the world on digital solution for the COVID-19 surveillance. We are pretty proud of that, but it's a generic platform. So why stop with the COVID-19, we have for many years uh, water sanitation and nutrition and even agriculture, uh, but of course also education. So here at the village level, level, all these are in one topic. So when you come down to the community, everyone is dealing with this cross across food program, 
waste water, water hole, any sudden sanitation, education. How can we get the, the teachers to attend the classrooms? So we are working and we got from Nora again. Thank you, Nora again. How can we reuse the IT capacity in the countries, the platforms feasibility? Is it possible? And we have shown proven, yes, it's possible. Something is happening behind here. Because we have DHS2 for education in all this country now, Uganda, Gambia, Esvertini, supported by UNICEF, Togo, Mozambique, Sri Lanka. And we have a PhD program following it uh, from KICS, GPE, Global Partner for Education. And we had why there is not so many Ministry of Education here, because we had a fantastic, glamorous um, DHS2 for uh, uh, Education Academy in Banjul last month, where we had uh, eight Ministry of Education present, 118 countries, all the uh, partners that are in that space were there. It was super 118 participants. Um, so that's, and we will have a, a, a sh not a show. We will have a DHS2 for education just after lunch for people that are interested to hear more about it. Because this has mobilized a lot of energy in the his groups to see how they can also uh, support the country, not only health, but education as important. And very often uh, it will actually happen as programs in school, food program, measles campaign, vaccination campaigns in schools. Then it really truly help to have the denominators right in the schools and be able to monitor this campaign. You will hear more about that on Thursday in the cross-sector presentation um, from Uganda. And Lee Marty will join that one as well. Okay, I need to. And then we have another cool example. This is pretty new. This is from Uganda. I don't know so much about the case. I just grabbed it from the Slack where we are bragging about all the innovations that uh, this um, Ugandan government used the SSF an e governance tool for monitoring evaluation progress towards Vision 2040 goals, meaning all the development uh, uh, programs in the country. So using. Uh, this is a, just an example of how you can actually use it to monitor all your pro progress when it comes to uh, development of the country. So, we, you know, being truly e-governance uh, project. Oh, gosh, I have this as well. This I will do very fast. This is just, we are not, we are not Im including everything in DHS2. We can, we can, can. But we can also integrate with all the other systems. So, you know, integrate the data so you can have a holistic view of all your programs in a country, meaning either inside or integrating interoperability architecture, thinking architecture, very important. That will be a presentation and topic for Wednesday. How can we do make a national architecture? And how, so this is, this is the end because I think I'm used to too much time. Just to brag a little bit again, we are also into LMIs, of course. This is Mozambique. <laughs> And, and uh, monitoring the, the, the vaccine storage temperature. So just to, ex to show examples from the field, the local innovation that are shared globally. Thank you. Stop sharing. Ooh. Who's that? <laughs> 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 I hope you mute me. Okay, now it's good.
Others are here? Yeah, there you are. Let's see if I can stand there. So good morning. Good morning, good morning. We'll do some quick uh, informational slides. Um, obviously, we won't have time for everyone to introduce themselves for five minutes. So we put together a few slides with some statistics. Uh, but yes, it is a new record again. You see the data from the last time we had in-person meeting on, on the left there. Then we had 268 participants, and that was a record. This year, 326. So welcome. And there may actually be more because we have 288 from outside uh, the HISP center and we are actually more than 38 at the HISP center. So uh, we'll be, it'll be quite crowded this week and a warm welcome to everyone from 20, no, 72 different countries. That's again, a new record. That's pretty amazing. And 122 different organizations represented here. And as you know, since we're on Zoom, we have uh, about 400 plus participants also signed up for remote attendance. So there will be 700 plus listening and sharing uh, throughout this week. So where are you from? So this is a map showing kind of the distribution of participants. It says country of residence in the registration form, but you know, data quality can be an issue sometimes, but we, at least we have and it's a bit difficult to read, but we have, of course, participants from west, south to north, from west to east, a lot of participants, southern eastern Africa, as you can see. So also very happy to have a lot of participants now for the first time from the Emro Mena region. Many new countries there, including Jordan, Iraq, Pakistan has a big uh, delegation. We have the WHO Emro office here. Also, something happening in this region, more participation, PAO is here, and, and several countries represented, and many more online. So it's, it's great to see also that the community is growing. Uh, if uh, we try to have a diversity of participants, that's something we, we really strive for when we accept all the uh, registrations and make sure that uh, it's a good mix of participants. You can see that we have about 30% from governments, 22 from Ministry of Health, a few more from other governmental organizations. There's a big uh, group from international organizations and then uh, NGOs and, and other. And in other, looking at the list, there's a lot of universities, a lot of academia here as well, and then some private sector. So it's a good mix, good diversity, um, and that's what we want. So we have another record this year is that we have 31 different ministries of health represented. Last time we had 21. And I, I'd like to uh, go through this quickly so that you can uh, show who you are. So when I call, call the country, you can stand up and then we can wish you welcome. Um, I saw that there's still quite a lot of these badges outside. So there may be some, some visa and flight problems, of course, but let's see. Do we have anyone from the Ministry of Health or, or Government of Afghanistan here? Yes, welcome. Um, thank you. And then uh, Burkina Faso. Welcome. Burundi. They didn't make it. Stuck in... Uh... <laughs> Let's hope they get the visa and get through all the different airport strikes. Kotivar, Ivory Coast, welcome. And then there's a brand new DHS country, Equatorial Guinea. Anyone here? Welcome. Uh, we should have a big group from Ethiopia. Welcome. And then uh, Ghana, I know there were some, he said, hey, there you are, welcome. And Guinea, you have Guinea here? No, not yet. Hope they can make it. Indonesia. How about the ministry? That's the his group, maybe. They did. Tomorrow? That's good. Okay, Jordan. In the back, welcome. 
new countries starting with EGIS this year. Uh, Kenya, not a new but old. Welcome. Malawi, welcome. Maldives, welcome. And Mali, yeah, Mali, welcome, welcome. And another new country, Morocco, be here, not yet. And then Mozambique. Mozambique, not here. Namibia, more visa and airport problems. Uh, Nigeria, they always make it. Yeah, there they are. <laughs> Welcome. Pakistan, I saw a big group. <laughs> Who was that? Who was that? Yeah. So we didn't have anyone from Nigeria yet, no. Uh, I know that we have to go through this extra screening for Schengen visa. So it's been difficult actually to get visa for Nigeria this year. Um, then Pakistan, you hear? It's coming, yeah. We have other delegates, see UNICEF there, but we'll have ministry representing uh, later. Okay, then uh, Congo Brazzaville, Republic of Congo. Anyone here? No. And then Rwanda. Welcome, welcome. South to Mayan Principe. Are they here? Not yet. Then uh, Senegal. I saw Umo earlier. Welcome, welcome. It's been a lot of DHIS activity in Somalia over the last years. Anyone from Somalia? Yeah, welcome, welcome. And then the very first country to use DHIS, South Africa. Yeah. here. <laughs> Warm welcome. And then DRC. Anyone from DRC? Yeah. Welcome. Timor Reste. No, Timor. Ah, there you are. Welcome. And Uganda. Is Uganda here? Yeah. Welcome, Paul. Zambia, industry in Zambia, not here, no. And then Zimbabwe, welcome. That was the ministry, so we're about 20 something now, still a record. <laughs> then if you look at other organizations that are here, uh, I've ranked them by number of participants, you can see you may remember that uh, when we started announcing this, we, we had quite limited capacity. We thought people were not ready to travel yet. So we had an auditorium down there for about 175 people. And Alice gave you a hard time with you know, quotas of three to five per organization. And in the end, we have 17 from UNICEF. We have 17 from WHO plus PAO there. So you see a big group also from CDC uh, and MSF, BO. Many his groups, PSI, John Snow. So I think we can we can uh, do them quickly also. Who's from UNICEF? Can you stand up? Welcome. And then uh, WHO, do you want to be, Paul, do you want to be included or do you want to be separate? I don't know. And we can do all WHO and Paul. Welcome. <laughs> Great. We do, we do have actually many regional offices represented this year, and that's great. We have Afro, Emro, PAO, uh, all here. And we also have WAHO, West Africa Health Organization. Where is WAHO? Yeah. Welcome. And then we can do CDC. Welcome. MSF. Welcome. Bio, welcome, <laughs> and then PSI, welcome, and uh, JSI, 
Welcome, welcome. There you are. And we have Chai. Welcome. And then Paho, they, they stand up together with their WHO colleagues. FHI 360. Welcome. Uh, we have Global Fund, a few people. Yeah, welcome. And then we have Abbott. Welcome. <laughs> Great. Uh, UD, University of Dar es Salaam is here. UDSM, welcome. Uh, and then we have Oriole Global Health. Yeah, welcome. First row. And then, then I think you see many HISPs here and there many more. We had a whole week. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maurice. Uh, welcome, Dr. Feza. You were not on my list. Though. Yeah. Good to see you here. Um, then we had a whole week of HISP uh, discussions, strategic discussions and trainings last week. So we have many HISP groups. Kristin mentioned them all earlier, but maybe all the HISPs can stand up. Welcome. There are many. Great. Great. And since we don't have time to introduce everyone uh, personally, but we'll have many breaks, we'll have many social events, and we really encourage you to expand your HISP network and, and make new friends in the DJ2 community. If you want to know who everyone are and, and read their backgrounds, you can go to the SCED app and browse the participant registry. And that's also an opportunity for you to upload your most beautiful photo and write all the good things about your background. So you see some of them here. Um, And then, yeah, Christine talked about the agenda uh, and you have this sked up where you can go through it. We have four days of, uh, of uh, sessions. It's pretty packed. We'll start with plenaries in this room every morning, sometimes for 90 minutes, sometimes for the whole morning up to lunch. And then uh, we have another uh, building just across here. It's just 25 meters called VB, where we'll do all the plenary breakout sessions in smaller auditoriums. So afternoons will always be over there. And we have a map to show you later. We have a lot of diversity in terms of presentations. We have this call for abstracts out and we got 149 submissions. So big thank you to everyone for submitting. And, and the agenda now includes 173 unique speakers across 89 sessions. And so it's pretty amazing. But uh, I know that there's still badges out there and the morning sessions are historically a little bit low attended. So we have some super hot topics here starting 8.30 every morning. We like to party at Christian's Head, but we also hero during the day and the morning, right? So really want you guys to come here 8.30 every day. And then uh, all the details on the agenda you can find in SCED. Uh, you can browse it on your mobile. It's very easy. You can also download an app for it. Uh, you, you can create your own profile. If you have any problems, I guess you can contact uh, Alice and her team here. But I think most of them should have their accounts now. Is that correct? Yeah. And then you can also, it's very easy. You can also tick, especially when there are a lot of parallel sessions, you can kind of tick the one you want and build your own personal agenda. Keep it a little bit easier. We may do some changes. So as with DHIS, please remember to clear your cache frequently. That may solve problems. I think that's all we need to say about this one. Um, and then uh, we have a few kind of in the afternoon, a few special sessions. This afternoon, we have the use case bazaar. If you've been here before, you know what it is. We tried to change it a little bit today, but uh, it's basically a chance for, for many different uh, implementations to share their experiences. We have in total now 24 use case uh, presentations that will be in the bazaar in different stations. And then you can walk around and listen to them. There will be a little bit of speed dating. They will have maximum 15 minutes per round and uh, they will get a lot of exercise in presenting because they'll do it 10 times. Um, and then uh, to make it a little bit easier this year, we've created a catalog, a map of all the different stations. I'll get to that on the next slide. And then we leave it up to you now to choose where to go. 
we previously we had these groups where we move you around, but today you can go to the ones you want. And you will be able to do about 10 in the two and a half hours we have. So you have to pick the ones you're most interested in. So uh, if you look at this, we'll print this right away. So they will get a, a printout of this. So you can follow, you see all the presentations here and then the location on the map in the lobby area just across here. So that will be starting at 4.30 this afternoon. That was on the slide. Whenever this is going, you mm. need to change yeah. to another. Yeah, so you need to follow these instructions there. So we'll 50 minutes and then we have to walk to another one and they will start so that we start, they all start in sync. I think that would be, be fun. Great opportunity to, to meet people and have discussions in smaller groups as well. Okay, then uh, the other two afternoons on Tuesday and Wednesday, you will get a chance to talk to, to DHIS developers and uh, expert implementers one-on-one. -on -one. We'll have the expert lounge. We don't need any frequent flyer points. I know you have lost your privileges over the pandemic. This lounge is open to anyone. Uh, we'll have a lot of tables in the lobby area for Android, for budgeting and planning, for integration, data analysis, and then just stop by the table and then uh, you get the chance to talk to us. There will also be a few sessions in the auditoriums next to the that area on, on bigger topics where you can have group discussions and demos. So everything in the SCADAP, much more details there. So that is Tuesday and Wednesday, 4.30 to 6.30. And then you want to take this one, Max? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you got to stay around for the educational part before the party. Uh, my name is Max. I lead the DHS2 training and communication team here at the University of Oslo. Uh, I started just after the last in-person annual conference in 2019, so I haven't had a chance to meet a lot of you in person yet, although we have uh, exchanged emails or posted in the COP with each other. So I'm really excited to talk to people this week. Uh, and my team is helping out with the technical part of the conference. So if you have any questions or issues, uh, let me know and I'll try to get this sorted out for you. Uh, I want to give a big round of applause for Alice, who is leading the logistics conference. Thank you. So really what I'm saying is if you have questions, I'm going to go ask Alice what the answer is. Uh, but I'm here as a buffer to kind of absorb those questions and then have, have her fix it for us. Um, anyway, so we are live streaming this conference. Uh, this is the first time we've done a really blended conference with everything both online and in person. Uh, so that's why you're seeing like Zoom stuff on the screens. Hopefully that's all right. It means we have uh, a chance to reach a lot more people with this conference. Um, so if you're joining remotely, this is especially for people who are hopefully already joining us remotely, um, all the links to Zoom are in the SCAD details for each session. So you can go there, click on them, uh, and hopefully get right into the Zoom. Um, we are trying to keep it simple. So we have four different parallel session rooms we're using, and they each have the same link throughout the day. So from session to session, you just stay in that room or switch to another one. It should hopefully be fairly straightforward. This is the same as we did for our digital conferences the last couple of years, just in person. Um, their SCAD is also broken up into parts for several sessions. That's really just so it looks right in the schedule, but really those are just one continuous session. The session leads may have breaks built in, but um, just follow along. We're not trying to make it too confusing. Um, and then plenary sessions, what we're doing right now is we're streaming this on the community practice and on YouTube. So hopefully also reaching people there who might not have registered for the event, they can just watch it uh, live. So, um, we also are trying out something new this year. This is a live chat function on the community practice. So if you're on there, and if you click the link that was sent out in today's post, uh, you can get added to that chat group. And then you can have a live discussion with other people on the COP, including people who aren't here in person. And we're also doing French interpretation. So maybe it's best if Alice explains this part. I think Alice, you're already unmuted. Okay, so yeah. Um, so obviously the... So this year we'll uh, provide French interpretation for the French speaking community. So I'm going to switch in French. <laughs> voilà. <laughs> Donc uh, cette année nous avons les, tous les uh, tous les membres de la communauté francophone présents ici à Oslo pour la conférence annuelle uh, peuvent bénéficier de l'interprétation en français. Donc ce, toutes les sessions plénières seront automatiquement interprétées en français ainsi que certaines des sessions parallèles. 
Si vous êtes ici à Oslo et que vous souhaitez écouter les sessions en français, c'est très simple. Il vous suffit de vous munir d'un écouteur et euh, de vous connecter sur le lien Zoom que vous pouvez trouver sur SCED. Donc, euh, et s'il y a, si vous avez un problème ou quoi que ce soit, n'hésitez pas à venir me voir. Euh, ensuite, afin de bénéficier, lorsque vous êtes sur Zoom, afin de bénéficier de l'interprétation en français, c'est très simple. Sur SCED, de toute manière, vous allez voir que toutes les sessions qui bénéficient de l'interprétation française ont cette icône « English French ». Donc, euh, c'est là pour vous aider dans la sélection de vos sessions. Quand vous cliquez sur SCED, sur la session qui vous intéresse, vous avez le lien Zoom, vous allez sur Zoom. Ensuite, vous aurez un petit, un, une petite icône ici qui, qui veut dire donc interprétation. Quand vous ne voyez pas cette icône, ça veut dire que l'interprétation n'est pas fournie pour la session. Donc, si vous voyez cette icône, il vous suffit de cliquer sur l'icône et ensuite sélectionner français. Vous serez automatiquement dirigé vers l'espace francophone de la session Zoom et vous pourrez suivre la session en français. Voilà, merci beaucoup. <rire> Okay, and this is a general layout of the conference in the physical space. So for remote guests, just follow along. Um, so here we are. We are in the plenary hall, as you can see in the uh, right side there. Um, directly across the plaza from us is the room, building where we'll be having all the parallel sessions. So if you walk out the main entrance that you came in, just continue directly across the plaza, you'll get to the parallel session uh, hall, and they're all spread out across the back wall there when you enter. That's also where we're, going to, where we're going to have the use case bazaar and the pizza party later today. So primarily we'll be moving between these two buildings for all the sessions. And the plenaries, as Ola mentioned, start here in this building every morning at 8.30. Uh, lunch is uh, across to the left if you, ent if you exit this building. There's a bigger plaza there and you'll come to a building called Frederica. You go in the door and go up the stairs and we have a large cafeteria there. We'll be having lunch. Coffee breaks in the morning will be here, as you saw this morning. We'll have them in the lobby of this building. And then during the afternoons, when we're running parallel sessions primarily, we'll be across the plaza in the parallel session building. And again, um, SCED has all the information on where each session will take place. Uh, plenary sessions will always be here. And then for the parallel sessions, uh, just see which room. It's either one, two, four, or five. And you can see they're numbered when you get across the building, across the plaza. And again, I still need to know to get lunch. They have coupons. I, uh... What's the sorry? What do you need to get lunch? Your badge. Badge. You need yeah. You need your badge. Yeah. And uh, in the lunch area, if you are eating, for instance, vegetarian, we'll show you where the vegetarian area is. Yeah. But in any case, to access the lunch area, yes, you need your badge, please. So please Thank pick you. up your badge if you haven't done this already. I heard uh, there were a few people that haven't. So they will still be out there uh, in the break now, very soon. So please get your badge. This is also then your food. Yeah. And, and beer later today, I guess. All right, um, more details. So if you want to log into the uh, Wi-Fi network while you're here, the network to use is conferences. The password is there on the screen. Uh, this is also written down on pieces of paper out in the lobby. So if you don't take a picture of this now, you can get it up there. Uh, but don't share this on social media. You know, this is uh, we don't want everyone to log on to this network. Uh, okay, bathrooms. There are two downstairs, one uh, male, one female. To get them, go out the door to the right for men, left for women. And then there are also bathrooms in the parallel session building. Uh, and water. The tap water in Norway is perfectly nice and good and safe to drink. So if you want fresh water, just uh, take it from the tap. And, um, and use your brand new use cup. Use your brand new DHS2 cup. If you've got a bag, um, there's a cup in there you can use. And if you haven't gotten a bag yet, please take one. They're all hanging on the hooks outside of the door. And social events. So as I mentioned, today after the use case bazaar, we'll be having pizza and drinks. And this will just be in the lobby of the building across the plaza here. And uh, during that time, my team will also have a video camera set up in a corner and we'll be inviting people to come over and just say briefly, you know, what DHS2 means to you, uh, just so we can get your thoughts, anything you wanna share with us. So uh, we'll try to make that location clear um, when we're over there and uh, just invite people out to talk to us while you're enjoying the celebration. And I think Ola, you wanted to explain the yeah. So the, the grand grand finale will be on on Thursday after lunch. Um, for those that have been here before, it's a bit unfortunate that we're not be able to go to the island this year uh, because they are, are electrifying the ferries and uh, they haven't managed that process very well. So the there's been a long, a lot of long, long lines and people waiting and stuck on the island. So I don't want all of you to be stuck there. <laughs> But we'll find another location. We do something fun outdoors. Um, yeah, 
we will find some some uh, lake where we don't need to go by ferry. We we bring food, we'll bring uh, bring drinks and games. We can play football, we can go swimming and and have fun. So that's the plan for Thursday afternoon. More details will come later. Hope you can all stay for that. Thank you. All right, Alice, do you want to explain this part? This is the group photo. Oh, yes. So this year, it's a pleasure to go back to our old traditions. So the first one is the group picture. You are all invited to be at quarter to four outside the Sopus Vies Auditorium. It's basically on the square in the stairs. Please do not be late because we would really like to have like everybody on the picture. And it can take some time to organize, to, ar to arrange that. So please make sure to be there at quarter to four. And if the session is not over, you can remind you are your lead. And no, no social distancing. <laughs> and no social distancing. <laughs> yeah. Just squeeze for that one. Yeah. So, and another tradition of ours, it's obviously the, the photo challenge. So as usual, you take you the best pictures, get inspired by the annual conference. The only thing that we will ask you is to share them, obviously using the, the hashtag DAC2022. So you can share them on Twitter, on Facebook, that's fine. We just we just ask you to use this hash, hashtag so that we can recognize the picture and also find them. So yeah. That's a bit. Yeah, so remember 8.30 every morning. <laughs> and then, um, thank you. We, Lars and his team will start uh, the hottest of the hottest of the sessions, the what's new in DHS2 at 10.30 sharp, because they always spend a lot of time showing. Yeah, 10.30, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so 20 minutes or 15, 17 minutes. They, they always go over time and we need that one hour for lunch, so we have to start on time. So you can refill your coffee, say hi to your friends, and then please come back here as soon as possible so we can start 10.30. Thank you.